Ever wondered how to turn a component datasheet into a component model in LTSpice? No? Well, Alessandro D'Ambrosio was wondering. In particular, he was thinking about the MN3207 BVDIC. We'll be looking at that in a moment. But before that, the short answer of how to turn the datasheet into a model is that there is no short answer. It's quite a long and difficult process. Let's take a short example. The classic and familiar 555 IC made by Texas Instruments. Here we got the datasheet. And we have two very valuable pieces of information in here. First of all, we've got an equivalent schematic diagram. And then if we look a bit further, we have a block diagram. Now, these are the two main ways in which you can turn the IC into a component model. And LD Spice gives us a bit of hand in here. First of all, we can look at the model made from discrete components. We actually have it here in the examples educational folder under any 555. Somebody was nice enough to create this 555 IC from individual transistors. This would be one way of turning the datasheet into the model. As long as you know the parameters of the transistors, you can create quite a good and accurate model by doing this. The second way is to take the block diagram. To take all of these little blocks and model them as ideal components in LTSpice. Normally, this should give you a much smaller and more efficient model. Efficient from simulation point of view, the time it will take to actually simulate it. If you look at this model, we can look at it in the SPICE netlist option and we will see all the components and how they are interconnected. Let's just run this default simulation. It takes a bit of time, so simulation doesn't run very, very fast. Now also LT Spice gives us the option of using the NE555 as an idealized component. It's under the MISC components NE555. Now this component should work much, much faster because the model is much simpler than the discrete transistor one. If you want to see this model, you can simply go into the LT5, LT Spice folder under lib sub, and then we have this NE555 library file. If we open it, we will see that this is quite a small little model in comparison to our netlist. Let's just put them side by side. So we can open the netlist, which is more than a page, and we can open this little file, which is much smaller. So the model on the right will be faster, but might not be as accurate. Of course, you can go and make a very accurate, very complex model. And this is, for example, what the guys at Texas did. You can look for the model of this 555 component, and you will find it as the TLC 555. And under tools and softwares, you will find the SPICE model for it. And if we quickly open it, we will see that this time the model is a much, much more complicated, much more detailed model than the default one we can find in LD Spice. So we will expect this thing to work slower, but much more accurately. So these are the things you can do. Either put in all the components or turn the block diagram into small individual idealized little components, which you then interconnect. Simple? No, it's not. Okay, so let's start with the component that we're actually interested in today, the MN307. First thing to do is find a datasheet for it. So the next step in generating the model after finding the datasheet is understanding it. Here we see some of the component values, its limiting parameters. We don't get a block diagram, but we do get this circuit diagram. And this will be quite difficult to model because these transistors are CMOS, so not the standard MOSFETs or JFETs or whatever you can find in LTSpice. And if you're having trouble understanding how this thing works, since that will be the first thing to do anyway, you can look up what a BBD circuit is. BBD stands for Bucket Brigade Device. So let's just quickly look up what that is. Now, the best document that I found in which this is explained would be this one. It's quite an old document, it's from the 70s, but that's when this IC was created anyway. 
And this goes into quite a lot of details of how this circuit is built, how it's working, how anything. Quite a long document and if you're really curious, I recommend you look into this. It's very informative, very well written. But the short answer of how this circuit works is by comparing it to a sample and hold circuit. Basically, we got this right here. We got our analog input signal. We got some switches. When the switch is on, a buffer capacitor is, is charged with the input signal voltage. Then this voltage is mirrored using a, an ideal diode. And then we got another set of switches. So when the first switch is on, the second switch is off, we charge the first capacitor. Then in the next cycle, the first switch is off and the second switch is on and the voltage information from the first capacitor travels into the second one. On the next cycle, the second switch will be off, the first switch will be on, and the information will pass through. So basically, this is what the MN3207 does. It takes individual values of the input signal, charges capacitors, and then takes the information through each of these stages. If we look at the circuit, we have the first buffer and then the first switch, first capacitor, amplifier, second switch, second capacitor, and again the amplifier. So basically it will work just like in this circuit. We have the two clock pulses, CP1 and CP2. Each of these will be driving either the odd or the even number transistors and then the information will pass through this. It will pass through all 1024 actually 26 memory blocks. So to start creating the model, we'll create the model as a schematic and then extract it. So what do we want to actually simulate here? Well, we can quickly look into the data sheet and we will try to slowly build up this circuit. So we will need our inputs and then we will need switches, capacitors, more switches and buffers. So let's start building these. Start with the command signals. So we will need our clock signal. Let's just make this as a pulse, goes from zero, five volts. So the timing we can extract from the timing diagram. We see that the two clock pulses should not overlap. So we will need a bit of spacing between them. And as frequency, we need something between 10 and 200 kilohertz. So to get the 100 kilohertz signal, we need a period of about 10 microseconds. The on time, we need to make it less than half, so we can put 4 microseconds and give it a rise and fall time of about 0.1 microseconds. This we can call our clock 1 signal and then make another one that is out of phase with this one. And let's just see what happens if we run it for a bit. So we will see the first clock signal and then the second one. Not quite right. We see that the two are overlapping. So we don't want that. We can give actually the first one a bit of a delay. So give this one microsecond delay. And now the two clock pulses are not overlapping. So we can clearly see there's a bit of a gap in between them. So we can use this. These will be our two clock pulses. We can actually give this name to the nets. Good. Well, if we quick look in the data sheet, we see that apart from the two clock pulses, we have a ground and a supply voltage. These are not very critical. And then we have the input signal. So we need to put our input signal in. Again, a voltage source. And for this, we will be using sine wave. So now we can actually start to simulate the circuit. We need switch. And LD Spice has these switches. If you look in the component list, we will see this SW, voltage controlled switch. So let's just put one in here. So this switch will model our very first transistor, which has to be connected to CP2. The ground pin we can connect directly to ground and then the plus will go into CP2, input goes to input, and then we see what we do with the output. 
the output goes into a capacitor. So let's just place a simple capacitor. Value doesn't really matter. We'll give it one nanofarad. Now if we run the simulation, we have a problem. There is no model for the switch. So, and some more errors. So how to model the switch? Well, if we look in the help, we will see some details about the voltage control switch, the one which we are actually using. It has a few parameters we can set, has some defaults, which usually are good, but we will edit them. So the main thing that we actually are interested in is the threshold voltage, the voltage at which the switch switches. We can make it 2.5 volts for the moment. So simply create a model for the component called switch, which is of type switch, and it has a threshold voltage of 2.5. So this will be a global model we will call all our subsequent switches SW. Now if we simulate, we see that the switch is working correctly. So at every clock interval, it's charging up the capacitor with the specific value of the input signal. Good. Now we can continue with our circuit. So we'll need another switch connected to the other clock pulse, another capacitor. Again, connect the ground to ground and then get our second clock pulse in. Now if we run it, we see the input signal, the first capacitor and then the second capacitor. We see that our circuit is already starting to create a delay in the input signal, but we still have a problem. The final ver voltage is not really the one that comes into play. This is because of the two capacitors. When one of them discharges into the second one, it's losing some of the voltage. So to remove this effect, we will need one of these buffer transistors before. So to simulate that buffer, and we will need a voltage controlled voltage source. So the one that I talked about in my previous video, let's simply put it in here, connect the inputs to ground, and what this is going to do, let's just set the gain to one. So what this is going to do, as you can see, it gives the exact voltage from the first capacitor into the second one without any losses. So we're starting to see that our circuit is slowly shifting our input signal. And to continue, well, we need another 1024 of these pieces. So let's make just a few of them for start, and then we'll make more. So this is the basic building block of our bucket brigade device. The pieces that I'm copying are actually the bucket circuit. So each of these is taking the voltage, switching it, and then charging a buffer capacitor with them. And now if we run the circuit, we see our input signal, first capacitor, second capacitor, third capacitor, fourth capacitor, fifth, and so on. And we can see that our signal is slowly going through. Now we will see that it's quite messy and difficult to understand, but we can change that. Simply make the frequency smaller and simulate for a bit longer time. So we will simulate for one millisecond with one kilohertz signal. Now if we zoom in, we clearly see how our signal is being pushed through our circuit. So actually getting a delay. Now you may be wondering, if we look back into the circuit, why I connected the capacitors to ground and not to the clock pulses. Well, this connection is done to enable the functionality of this transistor, which in our case has been replaced by voltage controlled voltage source, so we don't need to do this anymore. So that's why these capacitors are connected to the ground. But basically, the circuit's functionality is exactly the same as the one in the data sheet. Well, I've got six of these things. Now I need to make another 1000. This is gonna take a while, but I'll get back to you in a moment. Copy then one block at a time. Make our third block. 
and our fourth one. So this will be all of the 1024 basic blocks for our circuit. Now simulator is running really really slowly so any sort of operation just adding a simple net is barely running. Good, so the circuit is complete. We've got 1025 switches. So let's see what happens. We're running at a whopping 20 something microseconds per second. Hey, it's actually running. Come on, I wanna look at this. Show me the output. Yeah, again, using quite a lot of memory also and full processing power. All CPU is running at full, at full strength. RAM is slowly charging up. Ha! It works. So five minutes later, we see that our signal is actually passing through our circuit. But you may have noticed by now that this monstrosity that we created with around 3000 components is completely unusable. So you wouldn't want to perform this sort of simulation every time you have a run. You, don't, you wouldn't want to wait for so many minutes. So let's just stop it right there and see how we can turn this thing in something much more manageable. Well, we have an answer for that in the form of the behavioral voltage source. If we look into the help file, one of the things we can do is take advantage of one of the functions that the arbitrary voltage source has, and that being the absolute delay function. What this thing does is create an artificial delay of a certain value. Unfortunately, this will not be programmable using a clock signal, it will be a user-defined var variable. So let's see how this thing works. Simply we take one of these voltage-dependent voltage sources and replace it with a behavioral voltage source. And the function will be to delay the voltage by, let's say, 10 milliseconds. And now if we run it, and then on the output, we don't get it since it's more than 10 milliseconds. Let's just put one to show how this thing works. And we see that we get our one millisecond delay thanks to our behavioral voltage source. So by putting any sort of value we want in here, we can get the desired delay. This will greatly simplify the complexity of the circuit and it will make it much faster to simulate. So we got the main part of the circuit, the delay bit properly modeled. Next part is the output stage. And we can see here in the real circuit that we have a couple transistors working as voltage follower stages. So again, we can model these as voltage dependent voltage sources or something else. But I will go with the... And from here, we will get our two outputs. So we can simply call these just like in the data sheet, output one and output two. And regarding the formula, well, we need to take the information for the output stage from two consecutive buffer stages. So we can simply take these two stages, the last two ones, and just give them some node names so that we can use them in the formula. So let's call this node one, and the next one will be node two. Now regarding the formulas for the voltage sources, we could simply say that we want the output voltage to be exactly the voltage on each of the nodes. So let's take for the first one the voltage on node 1 and then the voltage on node 2. And if we do this, it will work just like before. So if we take the voltage on node 2 and output 2, we get exactly the same value. Now here we can start to insert some of the non-ideal behaviors of our circuit. 
Strictly speaking about the output stage, we have this nice little diagram in which the datasheet is telling us how the output voltage is regarding the input. So the circuit can start working with 2 volts of input voltage, it can't really output anything lower than 2 volts. And then the output voltage needs to be almost 1 volt below the supply voltage. So in this case they made a measurement at 5 volts and the maximum voltage output was 0 0.75 below the supply voltage. So we can insert this into our model. First of all we need to specify the input voltage since this is a parameter in our output voltage. So quickly add voltage source and just call the net it's connected to the VDD. And let's just play with 5 volts just like in the example. So how should the output voltage look like? Well again we need to insert a special formula. We can start with an if. So as we said we need to compare the voltage that we want to put out with some thresholds. The voltage needs to be at least 2 volts. So if the voltage is smaller than 2, then the output will be 2. If it's not smaller than 2, then we need to compare with the maximum voltage we can output, that being the VDD minus 0 0.75. Add some brackets. And in case we exceed this threshold, then the maximum voltage will be the VDD minus 0 0.5, minus 0 0.75. And finally, if not, then we can actually put out the voltage that came through our circuit. So hopefully I put all the brackets and everything. See if this works. Yeah, it didn't. Perfect. So now let's see our output voltage. Well, it's limited at 2 volts since the voltage we are trying to put out is at a maximum of 1 volt. So we need to fix our input voltage. We put in a sine wave around 0 volts plus minus 1, so that's completely unacceptable. We can put in a DC offset of 3 volts, so this time our signal goes from 4 volts to 2, exactly, and now our output voltage is working. So let's just see that the formula I inserted actually works correctly. I will insert a larger signal. So my input signal will go from 4.5 down to 1.5 and this time we should see the limitations. And exactly you can see that we are limited at 425 volts and at 2 volts. So this is the limitation coming from the output stage. Now I will copy the same formula to the other output and simply change node 2 with node 1. So right now my two output stages are working correctly. Good. Next limitations. We know that the supply voltage needs to be between 4 and 10 volts. Anything that's outside this range should stop our circuit from working. So for that we can simply add some switches. So move these two outputs a bit to the side, add a couple switches. And what I'm planning to do is to turn these switches off in case the supply voltage is not in the correct range. So connect the two switches to ground, connect their signals together and simply make another voltage dependent voltage source in which I'm checking the input voltage. So pretty basic check function but this will clearly shut down your circuit in case you're doing something wrong. So again the formula needs to be an if. So if our VDD voltage is larger than 4 volts then we need to check if our VDD voltage is smaller than 10. In case both conditions are met, actually I think we can put the logical end in here so we don't write such a long formula. Then the output is 1. Actually I think it needs to be 2.5 because that's how the switch is modeled. Otherwise it's 0. So let's see. Yep, it's working. Output is working correctly. Let's just change our VDD to something else make it 12 and this time output is still working so that ain't good so my voltage dependent voltage source is working correctly but my switch isn't now why would that happen let's just add a static output load maybe this is the problem we have a leakage voltage 
Yeah, exactly. Right now our output voltage is roughly 900 nanovolts. So if we have no output impedance, then the switch is not working correctly. So right now our circuit is checking for input voltage. Now we have some more supply voltages that we need to take into account, so not just the VDD. If we go back to our datasheet, we see that we have a gate supply voltage, which needs to be exactly 14 fifteenths of the VDD. So we can add this also as a voltage source. So if we play with 5 volts, then this should be 467, I think. We'll see in a moment. And now how to add this also in here, we can add it as another AND condition or we can play around with some more functions that LTSpice has to offer, namely the digital components. And we need the AND condition, so we need both of these to be ok to make our circuit work. So here we will add that the voltage on VGG is larger than the voltage on VDD divided by times 14 divided by 15 and since no actual voltage is going to be exactly what we need we can add here a bit of tolerance so make it 13.5 and then add the other condition that the VGG needs to be below VDD times 14.5 so this will give us a bit of tolerance and if this is met then 5 if not 0 so let's just see if this also works Again, we have an error somewhere. And now both conditions are met. The switch is switched. And the output is not working since our model is not giving enough voltage to our switches. So we need to change the output voltage of this digital circuit. And here we have the output voltage high, which we can set to 5 volts. So simply add here to the first line that we want an output voltage of 5 volts and now the circuit is working correctly. So it's giving us our input signal shifted. Okay, what else should we implement from the datasheet? Well, we can implement the clock voltages. At the moment, our switches are working with voltages below and above 2.5 volts. But in practice, we need our low signal to be below 1 volt and our high signal to be as close as possible to VDD. So let's insert this. Also we need to take into account that any sort of voltage between the low and the high voltage leads to an undefined state. Basically meaning that the state of the clock should not change. So the easiest way of implementing this is adding a set reset flip flop. Again we need to take tell it that the output voltage should be 5 but we need to work on the input voltages a bit. Well again we can work with behavioral voltage sources. So this logical gate will need either a 0 or a 1 volt to set it. So if the voltage is above the voltage on VDD times let's say 0.9, so 90% of VDD, then the output is 1, otherwise it's 0. And the same logic can be used on the lower threshold, to, so to reset our flip-flop, this time the voltage that we are working on should be below 1 volt. So let's see what happens. We have a problem. That's what is happening. Yes, the net VCP does not exist. It's only called CP. So we can see our circuit is not working at all. Odd. May need a bit higher output voltage to work correctly. Let's just put it to 5. Okay, so now our clock monitor circuit is working correctly. Now the same sort of signal conditioning needs to be done for the other clock poles and just replace CP1 with CP2 and our final circuit should still be working yeah now the last thing I think that would be important to implement since this directly affects the functionality of the circuit is to make sure that the clock pulses never overlap so to make sure that we have this clock cross point which needs to be a maximum of 0.3 of the high level voltage of the clock pulse. So how to check this? Well basically we can add another voltage dependent voltage source which checks if at any time the voltage on the CP2 and the voltage on the CP1 both exceed 0.3 of the high level clock pulse. So I will add it here at the end. Again voltage dependent voltage source. These are quite handy when making models. They're actually the main building block. And again an if function. In case we do have this problem, then the output should be 0, 
otherwise should be 5. So let's just run the simulation and we see that we actually have problems. So from time to time we are violating this condition. So this isn't good. So we see that the output is looking quite horrible. And I think we can leave it like this. So if you see this at the output, it means that you're doing something wrong. So let's just fix it for the moment to check that the simulation is working correctly. Correct the rise and fall times back to 100 nanoseconds. And this time we see that there's no more overlapping and the output looks perfectly clean. So now that we are done, we need to extract the netlist. For that, the first thing will be to remove everything that is useless from the schematic. So this includes all the voltage sources, the model we still need to keep for the switch. And now that the schematic only contains what we need inside the model, we can view the netlist through the view view netlist command. And simply we take all this text and create model from it. So for that, we will need a simple text file into which we have added our netlist. We can actually remove these this from the from the end. We can add a bit of text at the beginning. We can call it the model for MN3207, whoever made it. And then we need to call this a subcategory that has the input and the output pin. And we can put them in the order that they appear on the package. So starting with ground, two, three, and so on. And the first pin is ground. So just save this. You can put it inside your LTSpice file or anywhere else, call it text, call it sub, whatever. So now we can import it into LTSpice and create a model just like you saw in one of my previous videos. So let's quickly open it. And now we can create symbol from this generic symbol, save it as this. I don't want to edit it at the moment. And to test it out, we can quickly make circuit with this. So it, it ain't pretty, but this is just to show that the model that we created is actually functional and it does what it's expected to do. So now if we run it, so now we can see that our output voltages are working correctly. And we, if we look at this resistor divider thing, we see exactly why this was implemented. It mediates the output voltage of the two outputs and makes it a bit smoother. So basically, this is how you create a model. I will leave links to all the simulation files in the description. Hope you got some useful inf information out of this. Let me know if you like this kind of videos, which are a bit longer, if anybody's still watching, of course. And see you next time. Have a nice day and bye bye.